the Merchant of Venice is one of the most important plays of Western civilization, and it's been exported all over the world, and different countries read it in different ways. The way it was read in apartheid South Africa, for example, with uh, black Africans identifying with Shylock and the tragedy of his situation. In Egypt, in Arabic, it's read as uh, Shylock wanting not a pound of flesh, but the land of Palestine. It's also assigned in high schools in China when they study Shakespeare. That's the play they read. I don't know what the students are coming away with in China. But the irony of the play is that it's about a Jewish user, a money lender, Shylock. And yet the reality is that very few Jews, very few actually practice money lending, even in England before 1290 when they were expelled. So there is a kind of myth about the Jewish money lender that's developed and it's been enhanced by the play. I try to explain to students that historians sometimes are deeply immersed in the cultural myths of their day. And we have to think about what is informing the way the historian is reading certain documents and constructing a narrative. So we have, of course, this uh, myth of Jewish usury. And you know, it runs through historical works too. People have a book called Shylock Reconsidered, for instance, or Shylock's Children, books that just, books by Jewish historians that assume that in fact Jews were moneylenders and that this played a major role in the expulsions and the pogroms and so on. But you know, it's not the case. You have to stop for a minute, recognize the myths or the cultural assumptions that you carry, that we all carry with us, and take another look at the evidence. What's really going on here? And be very cautious. The irony of the play comes in Act 4 in the courtroom scene when Portia walks in. Now Portia, in Shakespeare's day, all the women were portrayed by male actors. Portia's a woman, but she has to dress herself as a man in order to present herself to the court as a, as a lawyer. So she comes in and she gives a beautiful speech, a famous speech, about mercy and how mercy is actually twice blessed. It blesses the one who gives it and the one who receives it. And it's a beautiful speech. And it represents in some way the essence of Christianity. It's about forgiveness and love. And of course, the mercy that she wants Shylock to feel toward Antonio, because Shylock wants a pound of Antonio's flesh. But as the courtroom scene develops, you know, when at first Shylock is thrilled to have Portia, disguised as a man, defending him on his side and saying that yes, this is the bond and it's, it's accurate, it's legal, and he has to take his pound of flesh. But then, then there's a pause as Shylock is raising the knife. And she says, just a minute, the bond says a pound of flesh, but it doesn't say anything about blood. So if you take one drop of Antonio's blood, she warns Shylock, you're gonna lose everything. Now, of course, logically, you can't cut a pound of flesh without spilling blood. So what does that mean? Well, what Portia argues is what we call in English hair splitting, or in Hebrew, pill pull. It's this kind of legal thinking. In this case, what's so interesting about it is that hair splitting legalism has always been associated with Judaism, whereas Christianity is associated with mercy and love. Go above the hair splitting, above the law. Look at the higher purpose. So the striking thing is what, is, what is Shakespeare trying to get us to understand here? Here she is, a woman dressed as a man, speaking Christian words of mercy. But in the end, she defeats Shylock using the tools of what we would call Jewish legalism. So is she presenting a Christian claim or is she presenting a Jewish argument? So is Shylock being defeated by the Christians? By the Christians who were using Judaism against him, one might say. Does Shakespeare want us to recognize and read the play, so to speak, against the grain? So Shylock was first portrayed as a, as a devil, uh, a kind of satanic figure, and he was put on stage wearing a red wig to signify that he was a devil. And then later in the 19th century, he was viewed by Henry Irving and others as a tragic figure. Look at the tragedy of Shylock. What I like about Karen Kunrad's production and her interpretation is having five actors present Shylock in five different facets of his personality. Because Shylock is often reduced to a stock figure. He's tragic or he's wicked, he's evil. But no, in fact, there are many facets. In fact, to all of us as human beings, we all have different aspects 
of who we are, of our character and personality. So she brings this out in the production. And the fact that she did it in the ghetto of Venice is also quite extraordinary, since that's the setting of the play.